Hello everyone and welcome to QuantPy. We have been discussing the HJM framework, but our discussion so far has been in continuous time. So we are going to quickly discuss how this framework can be interpreted in discrete settings. The interpretation will look obvious once we have seen the details, but it's not the first thing that comes to mind when one sees the HJM equation. We saw the HJM dynamics under the risk neutral measure. The equation looks nice and simple with the most space taken by the drift, which is not complicated either because we know what an integral is. You know, we can approximate the integral with a summation, but it doesn't provide any insights into how the drift is linked to the arbitrary free pricing or how to interpret the dynamics in real life terms. Let's go back to first principles. We know from the previous video that the HGM SDE represents the dynamics of an instantaneous forward whose maturity time is fixed. To translate this into a discrete universe, let's replace the continuum of forwards by a finite set of forwards, where the columns represent the partitions. You can think of these as time t0, t1 and so on. And we will just use the index, which is just a 0, 1, 2 to identify them. The first row represents the current values of the instantaneous forwards. You can think of this as the current instantaneous forward curve divided into buckets. And you can think of the instantaneous forward in each bucket as an average of its values over the relevant interval. So the first entry represents the average of the instantaneous forwards over the interval from 0 to t1. The second entry represents the average over the interval from t1 to t2 and so on. So we are keeping the analogy with the instantaneous forwards and not replacing them by the simple forwards which are more prevalent in discrete settings. When time moves to t1 then the forward curve shifts and we can represent the new forwards by just updating the first index because remember each entry represents the forward rate at first index for instantaneous borrowing at the second index. The first entry is no longer applicable because it refers to the past now, time zero when we have moved to time one, and we can fill in the remaining values. Let's quickly discuss how the bank account and the price of the zero coupon look like under these settings. We need this to apply the risk neutral valuation approach, so understanding these is important. Now we know from the definition of a bank account that you keep investing the money at the prevalent rate. So the applicable rates will be the diagonal entries. We start with 1 quid, invest it at the current instantaneous rate and it grows to this much by time t1 which is the end point of the first interval or the start point of the second interval. We assume that the size of each interval is equal to h though you can make it variable if you like. We then reinvest it for another period and so on. We can combine the exponentials by adding the terms in the exponents. And we can write this for a generic time index i as follows. For the zero coupon, let's say we want to calculate the price of a zero coupon that pays one quid at time t4. So we just discount the one quid using the forward rates over the relevant intervals. And we can combine the exponentials. This summation is an approximation to the integral when the interval is divided into four subintervals. As time moves by one interval, remaining maturity shrinks to three intervals, and so the price becomes, and so on. We can write this expression generically as follows, where capital T equals Tn. Now we are ready to derive the HJM drift under the risk neutral measure. We know that the price of any asset expressed in the units of the bank account is a martingale under the risk neutral measure. We can write a discrete version of this as follows. And we can shift the b in the denominator to the right hand side and take it inside the expectation because it's a known constant. We need the values of the bank account and the zero coupon at the next step which we can easily generate by shifting the indices. Let's determine the two ratios. Let's start with the bank accounts. We can split the range of summation of the second into two for alignment with the one in the previous equation. And when you divide one by the other, the common term cancel. 
and we are left with a simpler expression. We should have seen this coming. The bank account in an interval grows by the prevalent rate, so no surprise there. And now we can do the same for the zero coupon and split the longer range into two and then divide. The common terms this time don't cancel because the forward curves refer to different times. You can see the values of the first indices are different. Now when we multiply the two ratios, the FII term cancel and we are left with something that looks like the sum of the increments, which is essentially the discrete time equivalent of the HJM differential, which we know is equal to a drift term plus a volatility term. To represent these in the discrete settings, we will need to identify them with the time and maturity indices. We should have written i plus 1 to make the interpretation clearer, but as we are going to be carrying this around, I remove the plus 1. You can replace i with i plus 1 if you like, or we just have to remember that the i actually means i plus 1. Now we can substitute these into the expression and we can expand this into two terms. Now the term in the exponent is a normal variable. Let's calculate its mean and variance. Mean is easy because we know the expected value of the Brownian increments is equal to zero. By the way, we are assuming that the randomness is coming from just one Brownian. So at each time step i, the same Brownian motion applies to all maturities. So w doesn't depend on the summation index. Then you can take it outside the summation. For variance, we know the variance of the scalar times a random variable is equal to the square of the scalar times the variance of the random component. And we know the variance of the Brownian increments over an interval is equal to the length of the interval. So we get, we know from the geometric Brownian motion video that the expected value of the exponential of a normal is equal to the exponential of the mean plus half the variance. So if we make the substitutions, we get, now everything is a deterministic. For the exponential to equal one, the exponent must be equal to zero. And we can shift the h term to the right hand side. Now here's the trick that brings it all together. What's the increment of this process? Let's see. We increase the upper value of the index by one and then calculate the difference. And this is the drift up in instantaneous forward of maturity Tn and the interval from time i to time i plus one. Remember this expression? Right, so how does it tally with the continuous version? If you think about it, the drift is just one half of the derivative of the square of the integral. And if you approximate the integral with the summation, you get the discrete version we just derived. You can also write the drift alternatively by splitting the first summation into two intervals and then applying the a plus b squared formula. You get this expression after the cancellation of the square of the summation terms. Let's see a quick example. Let's say we have the current forward curve and we want to calculate the drift in the first interval. So i equal zero. Because remember we wrote i instead of i plus one. So one means zero in our representation. So as a first step, we substitute zero for i. Now we can calculate the drift sequentially, starting with the smallest. By the way, f naught has already expired, so we will start with n equal to one. We can substitute one for n's in the two summations. So the first summation produces one term and the second summation has zero terms, which we can simplify. Now we substitute two for n's. So the first summation has two terms now, and the second summation has one term. And we can infer what it would look like for n equal to three and so on. So the HJM drift is not too hard to understand and interpret in discrete settings. Now, could you try to derive the drift under the TF forward measure, you shall get a very similar result, but it's worth a try. And a question before you go, would you like to see how this can be implemented in a programming language, say C++, Python or MATLAB? I hope you enjoyed the video. 
and I look forward to seeing you in the next when we discuss the LIBOR market model.